Our final speaker of the day, Dr. Jeffrey Ralph, um, wrapping things up in, on a positive note. Dr. Ralph is an associate clinical professor in the Department of Neurology at the University of California, San Francisco. And he's a practicing neurologist who specializes in diseases of the nerve, muscle, and neuromuscular transmission. In 2004, he was appointed director of the Neuropathy Center at the UCSF Medical Center. Dr. Ralph is currently a member of both the Acad American Academy of Neurology and the American Association of Neuromuscular and Electrodiagnostic Medicine. He's also a board member of the Neuropathy Action Foundation. Dr. Ralph. Thanks very much for that very nice introduction, and thank you, Dominic, for scheduling me right after a celebrity personal trainer. <laughs> I know it must be very intimidating for him to share the stage with these very attractive neurologists and physicians, um, but anyway, he handled it pretty well. So I'm going to talk to you uh, today about unusual neuropathies. Um, and I'm just going to sort of jump right into a case. So um, this is a man who presents with burning pain. He's 65. Uh, he's an engineer. And he basically has burning sensations in his feet. He has good strength and his balance is OK, but the feet really drive him crazy. The feet often, and I understand this is probably a little hard for you to read up here, so I'll just describe the case. His feet are often sort of pink and red. Uh, and so he's seen in a, and on examination, his feet are actually red when you look at them. His strength is very good. And the main finding on the exam is that if you test with a, a safety pin and you go down below the ankle, uh, he basically jumps away from you. He has hyperalgesia in his feet. Um, so he's a man with burning feet. So let me ask you, does this sort of presentation strike you as a common or uncommon neuropathy type? Yes, this is what you have, right, many of you? That's why you're here. This is a common form, yeah. And so you already know what's a common neuropathy. Um, so the usual neuropathy is a neuropathy that's usually symmetric. It's painful. It's sensory predominant. So it's unusual for patients to come in with foot drops uh, with the most common forms of neuropathy. And it's very slowly progressive. And, um, and, and basically, the, the good news about it is that uh, there's not much in the way of motor disabilities, so people can get around, and, and many of you, as, as Jesse said, you know, you're able to get to this conference, and that's great, but you sort of live in this sort of neuropathy purgatory, where you can get around, but you're sort of dealing with chronic pain, and uh, unfortunately, it's a very difficult problem to reverse and treat uh, with all the treatments that we have. Um, so that's the common neuropathy. The unusual neuropathies tend to be more patchy. They often have weakness as a major feature, so they come in with foot drop, um, and they can have a much more rapid onset. Um, if untreated, these neuropathies can be very bad. They can be life-threatening. Um, but the good side of them is that they tend to be more treatable. So the bottom here, this is Bill Murray playing a, a neurologist in a movie. Um, so many of you have the common presentation of neuropathy, but, but often the cause is not clear. How many here, how many people here have an idiopathic or cryptogenic neuropathy? Cause is not clear. So I think about half the hands that went up before. So, so for many of you, the neuropathy, the cause is not clear. So um, most of you don't have the unusual neuropathy, so why am I talking about it? Well, I'm talking about it because they are, um, they can be very severe, as I said a second ago. Um, but they're also more treatable, so it's important to identify these folks. And many of you go to uh, neuropathy support meet group meetings. How many of you participate in group meetings or are leaders in groups? So a number of hands uh, up, went up. So it, it's important for you folks to sort of know, when you hear a, another person explain their neuropathy, whether this is sort of a typical type of neuropathy or an unusual one. And if it's unusual, then you should really uh, ideally push them to see uh, a neurologist for appropriate uh, workup. So now, now I'm going to go into four cases. Uh, the first one's the longest case. Um, this is an 80-year-old man that I saw um, who happened to go to the same, uh, he went, I went to Duke for college, he went to Duke, and he was a real big Duke fan, and we talk about that, he was a very uh, lively uh, chap. Um, 
I originally saw him uh, for uh, an EMG test. He was referred by his hand surgeon. And the reason he needed EMG of his hands is that he developed severe weakness of his hand muscles. So you could barely button, close, pick up things, use scissors, open jars, that type of thing. Um, he also had some sensory symptoms in his feet. And then on exam, he had wasting of his hands that were just like totally thin, without really any muscle bulk at all. He could barely m spread out his fingers at all, couldn't, could not pinch. And he also had lots of weakness below his knees. So he did have foot drops. Um, and he also had sensory symptoms and signs, but mainly below the, the knees. So he had a very severe uh, neuropathy. And, you know, it got severe over a, a relatively short period of time. This is six years since it started. So when I first saw him, you know, you always sort of think, okay, how weird is it? And, um, again, you probably may not be able to see these pictures, but you, I have sort of this continuum here with Salvador Dali on one end. And I don't know if you can you see the picture on the right? Who is that? Jimmy Stewart, who I thought was a very normal person. So, so in, initially I sort of thought he, this was sort of the middle of the road. I mean, it's a little bit strange because of the motor predominance and the fact that it seemed to go, it's pretty bad in a short, in a six-year period of time. So I did some electrical studies, and this is definitely not going to be, unfortunately, the print is going to be too small, so I'll read this out. So uh, the electrical studies confirmed that he had a very bad polyneuropathy. So that's a generalized neuropathy. And on top of that, he had carpal tunnel syndrome, or median neuropathies at the wrist, and also damage of the ulnar nerve, which is the nerve you hit when you hit your funny bone, at the elbow. So you had a combination of a very bad polyneuropathy with sort of entrapment neuropathies. And then I thought, well, his medical history is notable for diabetes, and folks with diabetes can get a polyneuropathy, and they can get entrapment neuropathies in the upper extremity. So I thought that maybe that's what it was. But then he came back in three months, and his neuropathy had gotten a lot worse. Uh, it was very hard for him to walk. Uh, he lost weight. He looked very unwell. There's no family history of neuropathy. So the rate of progression, again, I, so at this point, I actually saw the rate of progression with my own eyes. So I really thought this was getting to be a sort of a more unusual type of neuropathy. And you really, when faced with such a situation, you really um, pull out all the stops to do a workup. So he had a huge workup, including a lumbar puncture, which is a spinal tap test. And all of that was unrevealing. Um, so it was really unclear what was going on and then sort of, you know, life sometimes intervenes and things happen and the next thing that happened with him is he developed shortness of breath. And his uh, internist ordered an echocardiogram which showed an abnormality in his heart and it looked like there was something sort of getting in, infiltrating into the, um, the muscle tissue of his heart. And then on an EKG, the voltages, so an EKG measures basically the voltages that are generated by the heart. And the, those voltages were small, and you get small voltages if something basically um, disrupts the normal tissue of the heart. So if you have a heart attack, you get low, low voltages in one area, but this is all over the heart. So these doctors, the cardiologists who did this testing, was, were worried about a condition uh, called amyloidosis. Um, I don't know, has anybody here heard of amyloidosis? Okay, a few, okay, great. I'm surprised anybody knows. Um, so amyloidosis, uh, is this basically gunk that gets into tissues. And um, there's a long history of it that I won't go into, but it, it's sort of this, it looks sort of waxy and fatty, um, but as it turns out, it's actually protein. The term amyloidosis was uh, coined by this guy named Verschau, Ver and, and amyloid is not even the correct term for it because amyloid sort of suggests it's a carbohydrate, but it's really protein. And then even around the Civil War area, Civil War era, the doctors appreciated that amyloid was connected to other diseases. This is uh, a picture, again, uh, for those of you in the back, this is a little pink tr box, but basically what this shows are heart cells surrounded by this pink junk, and the pink junk is the amyloid deposition. So what is amyloidosis? So it's, as I said, it's protein. These are proteins that are outside the cell, and what happens is the proteins start to sort of aggregate together and form these fibers and the body can't digest the fibers. It's just, it's this insoluble um, stuff that can't be broken down. And the damage done is mainly by infiltration of tissues. And this is a very bad situation. You would not wish amyloidosis on your, on your enemies. So back to the patient. So he actually had a, a biopsy of his heart and amyloid was found. And then the question is, what type of amyloid is it? There are a number of different types. 
Um, so you had some basic testing done and they couldn't figure it out. Um, this was done, um, this testing was done at Stanford. And then the piece of the tissue was sent to the Mayo Clinic and they did um, mass spectrometry on it and they figured out that it was this type called transthyretin amyloidosis. Um, has anybody heard of transthyretin amyloidosis? Okay, one person uh, who has a, you know, background in this kind of stuff, sort of. So this is, you know, this is w getting weird. Um, and then uh, this is a, uh, a substance that's encoded by a gene, so we wanted to know if there was a mutation in that gene, and it turns out that he has a mutation in the gene. Now this is kind of weird because, um, uh, well let me, get, I'm gonna jump to this slide. This is, I think, kind of weird because uh, in the United States, well first of all, this is a very rare condition in the United States, it's like one out of a million people have it. And it, I think it's just sort of, uh, in a way, a little maybe mind-boggling that somebody with a genetic neuropathy would present it in 76. Um, you know, so sort of, you know, later in life. Whereas, you know, this is not always a rare condition. So if you are happen to be in Portugal or certain areas of Japan, one out of a thousand people have this. So it can be very common. And one of the other sort of interesting things about this is you can have the exact same mutation and then, but if you're Portuguese with that mutation, it's likely that other family members will have the disease. But if you are living in the United States, even though other family members have the mutation, usually just, usually just like one or two people will have the disease. So there's something about the milieu of other genetic factors and maybe even environmental factors that may play a role in uh, the manifesting this disease. This slide um, just sort of shows how um, the structure of this protein. So the protein has four, part, so four parts and it's sort of in a clover shape. And if you have a mutation in it, what happens is the clover falls apart and then the individual parts of the clover misfold and then bind together and form these sort of blobby things that you see in the bottom of the slide and then form these fibers that can't be digested. Um, so this, is a gen this uh, mutation in this gene causes a, uh, a genetic uh, neuropathy and this particular type of genetic neuropathy has emerging treatments. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to present this case because um, in general, we don't have many treatments for the ge genetic neuropathies, but there are emerging therapies for this one. So sometimes liver transplantation can help because this protein is pumped out by the liver. So if you give somebody else's liver to the patient, it can help. And there are drugs being developed uh, that I'll talk about a little bit more in a second. And then there are some fancy genetic and immunological uh, interventions that are being designed. So there's a lot of research in this. And again, there are certain areas in the world where this is a fairly common entity. So there's this drug that's being developed by Pfizer called Tefamidus, and what this does, is it sort of binds in the protein when it's sort of in the clover leaf shape, and it stabilizes it. So even if you have the mutation, it won't let it um, fall apart and then misfold into the fibers. And this is a, a drug that's approved in Europe, but it's not approved in the United States. So, um, so my patient, uh, the last time I saw him, he was still deciding whether or not to go on one of these uh, treatments. Uh, he had not made a decision. Now he has a daughter, uh, his daughter is uh, in her, she's in her 40s, I believe. And uh, so she has a 50% chance of getting the mutation. Um, so if you were her, would you, do you think you would get genetic testing done? Okay, of course, I guess everybody says yes. Um, the reason why you may not is that, again, even though the mutation sort of tracks through families, usually only one person in the family has a disease. So, I mean, would you want to know that you have something when it may, you may not have the manifestations of the disease. Um, but I think many of you feel yes. And I think the reason you're saying yes is that there are some emerging therapies. So, so I think I would answer yes too. So it turns out that she did have the mutation and there's a discussion about whether or not she should go on a treatment to help um, prevent the manifestations of the disease. But the, those treatments have costs and they can have side effects. So is it worth going on something when you don't really know if you're gonna get the disease anyway? So it's a very, it's very tricky. So for this first uh, case, the key points again are that there are emerging treatments for some of the genetic neuropathies, including this one. Um, in the old days, if somebody had a hereditary neuropathy, we said, well, sorry, you know, um, we can't do anything, but now we can in certain cases. Uh, and then there's this general principle that misfolded proteins can um, sometimes cause disease. And this is a major factor in the major neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's diseases, the problems with cells handling 
sort of stuff within the cell and, and processing it correctly and sort of throwing out the trash when the trash needs to go out. Um, and then the, the treatment for this type of neuropathy Neuropathy sort of highlights that if you can stabilize proteins in a certain fashion that you may prevent the development of, of disease. Okay, so now we're going to move into a uh, case that's a little bit uh, less serious. So this is a young uh, German woman that I saw who came in with numb patches. So she's 33 years old and uh, with really no medical problems, a very healthy, fit uh, woman. And uh, she came in because she noticed that uh, she had a numb, painful patch on the outside part of her left thigh. And she also had some uh, numbness in her right cheek. And the, the numbness in the left thigh came about after she was at an attending an educational conference, sort of like this one, and walking around and doing lots of stuff. And then she sort of developed this numb patch. And then after questioning, she said, well, yeah, I've had these other numb patches in my body, including the lumbar area. And then she had one on the opposite thigh too. And curiously enough, um, uh, oh, I, I think I'm going to yeah, get, get to it on this slide. So her mother also has had the, the presence of numb patches. Um, and when I saw her, her exam was really only notable for these sort of discrete numb patches, but her strength was normal, vibration sensation was normal too, and things like vibration joint position sensation, which sort of tests the deeper sensory fibers. So it seems like just the skin fibers are affected. And then she called again saying uh, that she has another numb patch. So she's sort of accruing these numb patches. Has anybody heard anything like this? Yep. Something like that? Mm hmm Wow, okay. So you may have something sort of akin to this. So um, this, the story of this type of neuropathy is interwoven with a guy named Robert Wartenberg, who was a neurologist at UCSF. And uh, he uh, was born a couple centuries back uh, in Lithuania. And then he did his training in uh, Germany. Uh, and he was a Rockefeller scholar. He did training in England and in the United States. And he was one of the most famous neurologists, at least in my field, uh, in, the last, in the last century. Um, and he uh, was a prominent neurologist in Germany, but unfortunately he was also Jewish. And he sort of, so he's sort of the head of neurology of this uh, clinic in the 19, early 1930s, but he realized he had to leave if he wanted to live. And fortunately there were physicians in San Francisco at UCSF and also um, a doctor named uh, Bernard Sachs of, there's a disease called Tay-Sachs disease uh, but this, this is the same doctor that sort of helped facilitate physicians coming from Germany to the United States and I, I, probably to England as well. So they brought Wartenberg out here, uh, really saving his life. But he was not really happy because he went from being the top big cheese in Germany to like low on the totem pole at UCSF, sort of like that's how I feel at UCSF now. Um, <laughs> But, it, but eventually he actually settled in. Initially he was sort of kind of a prima donna, like one of the former chairmen, you know, this is written down even, that he had this reputation for being a real hothead. Um, but very smart, he was fluent in many different languages. But he eventually settled down, he, he bought a house in San Francisco, and there's this, like, uh, there's this picture you can't see very well, but it's him at his breakfast table with his wife, and for some reason he's wearing his white coat at breakfast, a very formal guy with his father-in-law, and then he has his dash hound, he loved his dash hound. But he was, he was a very famous uh, teacher at UCSF. So Wartenberg uh, described patients with this thing called migrant sensory neuritis. And it, basically it's a condition in which you get this recurrent, well, what he described, what he said was it's modern neuritic affection changes place and at different times involves different non-contiguous nerves. So you're basically picking off little sensory nerves. And it's recurrent, intermittent, remittent, it's a vagrant neuritis. And neuritis means sort of an inflammatory nerve problem. And so basically what you get are these numb patches. And there's a picture here showing in black where the numb patches are in this person's feet. So this is all in a book that he wrote, these pictures. And it turns out that when you, the, when these pictures are actually of Wartenberg himself. He himself had this condition. And this is the, the professor, you know, half naked, showing a patch of numbness on the side of his thigh. So in, 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 in the book, he, he doesn't say that it's himself, but you can tell it's himself based on the description of the patient. He, he sort of outlines how he accrued these, these patches over time. And, and sometimes the patches would fade and then come back, sometimes in the exact same location or new locations. 
but there's never any motor disability. So this is sort of a, an unusual but benign type of neuropathy where you get these numb patches. So this condition answers a question I think when you're a, particularly a trainee in neurology, you wonder. You wonder is there such a thing as a multifocal pure sensory polyneuropathy? Because um, you have learned, you learned earlier today about a, a multifocal motor neuropathy, but is there sort of a sensory equivalent, sort of? Um, and the answer is yes, you can have that. It's called a migrant sensory neuritis. Um, now, this kind of presentation can sometimes be, uh, represent a serious problem, but usually not. And if you do blood tests and testing, it's usually, um, it's unrevealing if they really have this, if they fit this clinical pattern well. Um, it has a benign clinical course. So the main teaching point for no case number two is that not all unusual neuropathies are dangerous, after all. Okay, so um, how, how am I doing on time? About 10 minutes, Dominic? Yeah. <laughs> really, yeah, the treatment is not very well established. Even the, the pathology is not very well established e either. I mean, so lots of, for lots of conditions, we do nerve biopsies, but we recognize it, that it's benign, so usually nerve biopsies are not done, so we don't really know exactly what's going on pathologically. In terms of treatment, um, some patients are treated with steroids, um, but uh, there really isn't like a known effective treatment for that condition. Usually patients are told that this is a benign condition and you're just gonna have to, um, well, I mean, it's not very nice, but you sort of tell them to sort of, you know, live with the, these numb patches. And it's, a lot of the treatments are probably more dangerous than the underlying condition. Okay, so moving along, case number three. Um, so this case, I, I'm sure this type of case was presented earlier today. So this is going to test your ability to remember, um, remember uh, memory and recall here. So this is Tom. Tom has had a neuropathy for a long period of time. It goes back to the early 1980s. He first had some problems with limb fatigue, with biking and running, and you know had some problems. And then he developed a problem where he couldn't lift up the fingers of his right hand, and he was diagnosed with a radial neuropathy which is the nerve that does that. And he actually had a surgery to sort of decompress the nerve. It didn't help him, because that wasn't really the problem. And then he developed progressive weakness. He developed uh, then a left foot drop, then his left wrist sort of hung down, and then he developed a right foot drop with no sensory symptoms. And he was uh, put on a bunch of treatments, including prednisone and imuran and all sorts of things. And he's given a number of different diagnoses. Um, including uh, motor neuropathy. So he, was, he tried in 1992 and twice, just twice, IVIG. It didn't, he, didn't really, he didn't notice a clear benefit. And as a matter of fact, after those treatments, but it was many months after, he had a very severe sort of uh, progression in his neuropathy. And he thought that the IVIG actually caused the downturn. So he has not re received any treatment since then. And when I saw him, it's, he's, it's a quite startling picture because this guy, he's, he's, um, he goes to work, he's, uh, he, he's not disabled by it, but he has lots of limitations. Um, there's a slide here that shows his strength exam in number form. And again, I know you can't really read this, but there are a lot of zeros on this table. And zero means no movement at all. It's not even a flicker of movement. And he basically can't move his hands at all. He cannot move really much of anything below his knees. And if you were to look at him, you would think, you would think he's a, a patient with ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. That's what he looks like. Um, he doesn't have any reflexes, but his sen sensory exam is normal. And he has this sort of, uh, it's called a high stepping gait where he has to lift his legs up very high to clear the drop foot. Um, so he looks sort of like an ALS patient, but if you actually pay attention to his exam, it, it's as if he has damage to the motor pathways. And, and, I, and the sort of diagram, there's a diagram here of the arm with the, the various nerves. And if you sort of uh, examine them very carefully, it's as, it's as if you damage the motor nerves at the points where I have the little arrows on this picture. Um, so it has a sort of multifocal uh, present, uh, it's a multifocal type motor neuropathy. And so what is this? I heard it, yeah. So this is, this is MMN. This is the most severe patient I have with MMN. Um, 
And uh, I mean, this is all, I guess, self-serving talking about UCSF, but there is a UCSF story here with MMN. It was actually first kind of described by a physician who at that time was working at UCSF named Gareth Perry. He's, he's, now he doesn't work at UCSF, but he did back then. And um, when he described MMN, a lot of people didn't believe it existed, um, but it does. And then uh, my mentor at UCSF, Rick Olney, did a lot of work in, uh, in, in this disease. He sort of came up with the research criteria for it and also sort of a very common uh, guideline for diagnosis of this condition. So now the print is getting really small. Um, and I know this was discussed earlier today, so I'll be very brief. I mean, so a few things. The onset is usually in young folks, usually male often affects the upper limbs more than lower limbs, usually doesn't affect the, the face or the cranial nerves. Uh, it's basically patchy weakness in the distribution of nerves. If you do lab tests, not very helpful, not very exciting, even lumbar puncture. The one test that can, can come back positive is a GM1 antibody. Um, does anybody here be, besides Dominic have MMN? Because somebody, no, okay. Because um, about 50% of people have the, the antibody. And then the, the, electro, the electrical studies are very helpful. They show this thing called conduction block. The clinical course can be one of sort of the sort of chronic decline, or else it can be the stepwise decline, as in uh, this patient. And you get these, and I understand this is like putting up a, like a Chinese character up here, but this is, this is uh, the results of uh, nerve conduction studies. And there's this, for an EMG, this is a really cool thing where you get a good response when you stimulate close to your recording site and when you move up you lose that response and that's because the impulses are being blocked by the by the area where it's being in, uh, the site of inflammation and so basically the nerves are put into a zombie state where they're still alive but they can't conduct and the, the fact and the fact that you could have a nerve in this zombie state for even you know months or even years at a time is uh, kind of intellectually uh, interesting so sometimes making the diagnosis of this is easy, but sometimes it's tough. So on the, on the slide now is a young man, he's like about 18 with atrophied hands. So is this multifocal motor neuropathy? Well, no, he has something else. It's called Hirayama disease, which is a problem really in the anterior horn cells. It's sort of like ALS, but very benign. It doesn't spread normal lifespan. And Unless you knew that such a thing called Hirayama disease exists, it can be, you know, it can be a tricky thing. And so sometimes figuring out whether somebody has MMN or, or a type of motor neuron disease can be tricky. And sometimes you have to just give a trial of the treatment, which is IVIG, uh, which has been shown to be effective uh, with multiple studies. Um, there are other treatments, but IVIG is sort of the, the mainstay treatment. And most people need ongoing treatment. So in other forms of uh, immune-mediated neuropathies, you can treat for a while and usually wean people off, but unfortunately for this condition, it's usually, usually lifelong uh, treatment. So um, this is an acquired autoimmune problem that's treatable. And again, I think it's a very interesting entity for neurologists because of the fact that it's pure motor. And so much of what we see in practice is sensory, so just, just to know that there can't be a pure motor type is kind of intellectually, uh, I think, interesting. So this is the last case. Um, I know I'm on, uh, running out of time here, but this will take about a minute, I think. So um, there's a patient, a 25-year-old technology worker. She's uh, Indian, uh, moved from India to the Bay Area. And she came in because her face is a little bit weak, but it's weak in a very patchy fashion, which is sort of strange. On both sides, like around her eyes weak, and then her face when she smiles is more of a snarl than a real uh, smile. And then she has weakness in the muscles of her left hand and numbness in the little finger of her left hand. Um, and not appreciated at the time, but she also has these numb patches all over her body, sort of like the Wartenberg thing. Now, the next slide, what this shows, this is a picture not of her, but of another patient, but there's a slide of a patient, and there are these circular depigmented or pale lesions on the trunk. And then there's another uh, sort of picture on the right that shows these sort of dark areas that depict where the patient has impaired pain sensation. Um, anybody here have a clue what this could be? Oh, you get a gold star, great. Yeah, this is leprosy. 
So leprosy, when I was a medical student, we were t always taught that leprosy is the most common cause of neuropathy, which is hard to believe, but back then it was because I'm probably, there, weren't a, there were fewer diabetics than there are today, but it's still quite common in India and Pakistan in particular. So leprosy is something to think about when people come from India or Pakistan and have sort of a funny asymmetric neuropathy, particularly if they have numb patches. And generally young people uh, come in with it. Uh, for some reason it's more common in men than women. It's caused by uh, a mycobacterium leprae, which is sort of a relative of tuberculosis. And uh, humans can get this in armadillos and mangabe monkeys and chimpanzees. Uh, but it goes from human to human. So there are about four million cases in India. Although that may, this figure is from a few years ago. There may be fewer now, I would guess. But that's still a lot of leprosy. And there are about 2,000 cases in the United States. So it's rare in the United States. And there is a treatment for this. It's antibiotic therapy. And the treatment is very complicated because these patients can have these reactions when they start on therapy. So it's very specialized. So, um, so I'm wrapping up now, the unusual neuropathy. So just to review, I, I discussed a genetic type of neuropathy, the transthyretin amyloid neuropathy, where there's sort of emerging therapies for that. There's the Wart Wartenberg neuropathy, which is sort of a kind of an interesting, cool neuropathy, but we generally don't treat it. It's not real dangerous either. There's a the multifocal motor neuropathy, which can be very disabling. Um, and by the way, that, that patient is still He's reluctant to go on IVIG therapy because he had this, again, he had this, he's so gun shy from this prior episode that he, he thinks that IVIG made him worse, so he's not touching it. And then finally, an infectious cause, uh, leprosy. So again, the, the, the boiled down message of this talk is that for the unusual neuropathies, uh, there is a higher risk for morbidity, morbidity and mortality, but there's higher chances for effective treatment. And, uh, Thank you very much for your attention. I know it's been a long day. Thanks. Any, maybe just uh, maybe a few questions, and then if there are more, I'll ask. I'll answer them offline. Yes. Liz. Yeah. Well, it varies a lot, and it varies a lot with the payer. Um, things have changed. So, for example, um, uh, one sort of second or third line treatment for the inflammatory neuropathies is rituxan, rituximab. And that used to be very difficult to get approved. And now it's quite easy for uh, most people, most insurers will pay for it. And I think they realize that it's quite effective, so it's actually cheaper to give the more effective treatment that's you know, expensive up front, but over the long term saves money. Um, but there, there are all sorts of hurdles. So sometimes what happens is the, the treatment or the drug is approved, but then if it's an infusion product, the infusion services are not improved, uh, approved. So, and the patient can't afford the, that. So, uh, so it, it varies a lot. It's all over the board. Yeah. Yes. Um, if someone That's a very good question. So I am talking, this talk does include the multifocal type neuropathy. I talked a little bit about that, but when do you get concerned that you have something strange? I mean, when, when do you get concerned that you have leprosy or a vasculitic neuropathy? I think you get very concerned if you have more than one nerve affected. So if you just have carpal tunnel syndrome in one hand, we don't tend to do a huge workup. But then if you develop a foot drop, for example. Mm -hmm. That would be unusual, yeah. So, so the question has to do about thoracic outlet syndrome, which is this entrapment neuropathy up in the chest area. And uh, it's a pretty uncommon problem, even on one side. So to have it on both sides is unusual. So I think, yeah, you would have to be um, 
that, that would have to be thought of carefully. And, and it's possible there could be a genetic factor at play behind it. Um, so usually thoracic outlet syndrome is caused by tissues pushing into the nerves, such as a fibrous band. But if, you, if somebody had it on both sides, I'd worry about something like hereditary neuropathy with liability to pressure palsies, which is a genetic condition. So that would be in the more, well, uh, that's the point of this talk. So, I mean, that would be the unusual neuropathy. Maybe what last question in the back. Yeah. Not much. Not much yet. Um, I know, I, I mean, there, there are studies moving forward, particularly in uh, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, I know, um, including here in L.A. Dr. Dr. Balo at uh, Cedars is part of that study. So stem cell therapy is an emerging therapy, but neuropathy, um, not that much yet. Um, the problem is that, you know, nerves are... Um, uh, it's a kind of a tough problem for stem cells to fix because these fibers, you, you have a single cell that extends from the spine area down to your fingertip. So how do you get a stem cell to sort of integrate into that, that anatomy? So there's a lot, there are a lot of technical hurdles. Thank you. Yeah, thanks.